Hi, KubeCon. Um, I'm Vicky, and this is Jonas, and we're hey. from OpenAI. And so, yeah, we're going to talk about how Kubernetes has helped us build our infrastructure that powers the future of AI, and how we might have started as an unusual use case for Kubernetes, but we've actually managed to make it work so far. Um, so what is OpenAI? Uh, we're a nonprofit AI research company, and we focus most of our work efforts on both basic research and deep learning, which is an area in machine learning, as well as research in specific projects. Um, examples include robotics and uh, learning to play video games. So as a nonprofit company, our mission is to democratize the AI technology. And because of that, we care a lot about open source software. We rely heavily on them. And we also care deeply about benefiting from and contributing back to the community. So let's talk about the infrastructure. Um, what makes building infrastructure for a research lab running deep learning different from infrastructure at a startup? Um, so there are two key differences. One is the type of workload that we're running. We're mostly running large batch jobs. So the jobs can span from hours to days or even weeks. And sometimes we run a single copy. Sometimes we run tens of thousands of copies. So that puts a very different strain on the cluster. Um, and the type of jobs that we run often have very specific resource requirements. So this means running on special hardware that's um, configured for doing numerical computation. And some of that include uh, GPU clusters, and some of that includes just like specially networked computers. Um, the second key difference is our workflow. Um, a large fraction of our time is actually spent in the prototyping phase as opposed to maintenance. And what this means is research ideas come and go, and we don't want to invest a lot of time engineering something that might not make the cut. Yeah, so um, as Vicky just mentioned, um, we mainly do prototyping. And of course, we want to build our infrastructure to best support that um, and to really be optimized for, for this kind of workflow, which is very different from the workflow you would use when you're building, say, a web app with microservices. Um, and so a couple of key things that are important to our researchers is they need a solid platform. And that is because if they run their experiments and they behave like weirdly differently when they run it for two times, um, we actually don't have any knowledge gain because we don't know what actually happened. If something happened in the experiment or if something happened inside of the platform. Um, at the same time, since we're prototyping so much, that means we have pretty high code churn. Um, and um, the configurations that experiments run in change very frequently. This can happen like, in a matter of like, hours um, when, when someone is like, oh, yeah, let's try, let's try some different configuration. Um, and so our infrastructure needs to, be, needs to be flexible enough to be reconfigured super easily. Um, and so um, the way we're tackling this um, is by having a central infra team, which is Vicky and me and a couple of other people as of recently, that runs a common platform that the researchers use to run their experiments. Um, and so the goal there is to empower our users to run their experiments by themselves um, um, without needing engineering support, but at the same time be shielded from the complexity of the underlying systems, which is like the GPUs and different cloud providers that we use. At the same time, because we have such a small team, we also need low operational complexity. We want to set the thing up, and in the best case, it just works. Um, and this is where Coop comes into play. So up until a few weeks ago, um, like OpenAI's every team was just Vicky and me. We ran a Coop cluster across three different cloud providers, our own physical hardware. Um, we scaled up to 4,000 nodes, or we bursted up to 4,000 nodes, and it went pretty well. We had no major outages. Um, and the key thing that really makes this work for us is that Kube allows us to ship infrastructure as an internal product. Um, and what that means is um, if infrastructure is a product, it has to have specific like, product-like qualities. Um, the most important of which is it needs to have a consistent UI that's understandable and doesn't, and doesn't surprise users. By default, it should hide complexity, but it should also be composable so that if you need to do something that's inherently complex, you should be able to do it without ripping your hair out. Um, and it turns out that the Kube API is, also, is actually a pretty good candidate for, for us. Um, 
And so we've actually started treating organizationally the Kube API as the front end that we as the infrastructure team provide to the end users, which is our researchers. And so building on top of the Kube API is actually very nice. So Kube API is our primary service layer. And what this means is we can take advantage of a lot of the abstractions that are baked into the Kube API to help us compose the different components in our experiments. Um, so typically what happens is in the life of an experiment or a new research idea, uh, we start out as like a tiny, tip, tiny prototype that runs as like a single pod in the cluster. You know, you might have like one Python script that just runs a neural network, and then you see how that goes. And so as the idea turns out to be like more promising, we try to scale it up to tackle more complex problems. Um, and so what that usually entails is as you tackle harder problems, you, the trading time scales up a lot. And so we start to have need for higher parallelization, um, need to think of different ways of distributing the training. And also, if the idea seems promising, we also will need to run many different copies of the experiment, maybe running variants of the idea or running hyperparameter sweeps. Um, so here's an example of uh, a large batch of experiments that we've had to scale up very recently. So we, the example is that we're training agents to play video games, right? So we're running agents against all these like games on our universe platform. And universe is a platform of over a thousand video games that form a data set that allows our um, AI agents to learn to play different games and uh, you can see there's a diverse types of games. Some are like super simple and some are actually like fairly complex. So as we first start out, right, we have just the vanilla setup. We put a video game, let's say a flash game, uh, in a container. And then we also put our agent in another container and we just like run them together in a pod. Um, and this works super fine for like prototyping because you can use the same setup on your laptop and then you can like ship it off, run it remotely in our cluster. Um, but then it turns out, actually, that games are really complex. And so you, know, you can run this for maybe solving Pong or something. Um, and then once you start running like, into racing games or platformers, it actually takes our agents a lot of time to learn to solve it sufficiently. And so unless you're willing to wait for like hours or days, um, that actually is like a very long turnaround time to play with a new model. So then we've had to change it so that we can train in parallel. So what that means concretely is that like you have one master process, which is your TensorFlow parameter server, and then you split out your training into parallel workers that interact with their own copy of the Flash game. And then that way, you can split it up and basically scale your training. Um, once we started training this way, we can now tackle more difficult games. And as the complex games go, they have heavy graphics requirements and so on. And so they actually became the CPU bottleneck. And so what happened was we had to split it further into uh, the Flash games had to run on their own in a separate host. And then the agents would interact with the Flash game over the network. And they still talk to the master parameter server to um, update their models. And so this actually uh, means there's like a couple of intricacies in this setup, right? So there's like how we network uh, or like how we schedule the different jobs on the cluster so that they can um, have high networking bandwidth. And oftentimes the agent might have like special compute requirements. And so it's actually pretty complex to set it up. But in practice, all it took was just changing the YAML file. Yeah. So um, as you've just seen, for every experiment, um, usually we start out very simple. There's a single person running a single, single job leads to a single pod. All is well. Um, but then eventually, we'll scale it up. Um, and so 
the, 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 the speed at which the scale um, increases over time for experiments that are successful um, can be pretty intense. So like a typical, uh, uh, a typical thing to happen would be a researcher plays with an algorithm on a single core for, let's say, two months. Um, and then suddenly they realize there's a paper deadline. Um, and now they need to run all their experiments for, it, for their paper in, in two weeks. Um, and now they suddenly scale up from one core to 10,000 cores, um, which can happen. Um, and the thing is that it's, this is very hard for us to predict in advance, and it's very bursty, of course. Um, and that actually means that, uh, that we can't keep our cluster size constant, um, because that would just mean like it, it, it would either be too small, which means we can't run the big jobs, or it would be too big, which means it would be very wasteful, because we have a lot of idle capacity. Um, so that actually means we have, to, uh, um, we have to resize our cluster dynamically. Um, so, so to do that, we wrote an autoscaler. Uh, there's now also an official autoscaler, um, but, but we started doing that before the time, and it actually goes to show that that just using the primitives of the Kube API, this, this works pretty well and you can just make it work. You don't actually need to, need, need to have support from like uh, core Kube necessarily. Um, so what the autoscaler does is it gathers the state of what's happening in the cluster, um, like what nodes are there, what pods are uh, what waiting to be scheduled, like what pods can't we currently schedule because we don't have capacity. And this is just using the, the, the Kube API. Um, and then we actually provision new nodes exactly to fit to fit um, the, the resource requirements that are missing from the current cluster. And this happens using, using the AWS and Azure provisioning APIs. Um, and that means we have, different from how you would use auto-scaling groups, where, where they just scale up after there's a lot of CPU load for a while, we actually have complete control um, over the types of machines that join the cluster and the types of machines that, um, that do not join the cluster. For example, we can implement something like by default, put everything on spot instances because it's much cheaper to, to, to start that. Um, ex uh, except, of course, when people like, explicitly opt out, like, don't put me on a spot instance, I didn't implement checkpointing. Um, but basically, these, these types of policies is something that we can, we can very, very, very easily implement, and it's very cleanly separated from, from the actual logic that, that does the scaling. Um, and I think it's fair to say that this is a result of um, of how the Kube API is designed, in that it basically allows you to, uh, to interact with the, with the primitives that are provided using your own custom logic. So, <clears throat> why are we using Kube? Um, so, we've explained that our workloads are fundamentally different from maybe the common use case that Kube was designed for, which is probably uh, web services or microservices type thing. Um, so it wasn't perfect out of the box when we first set it up a year and a half ago. And, um, but actually, at the most basic level, Kubernetes exposes uh, very good primitives and interfaces that we can build on and abstracts away a lot of the complexities of the underlying infrastructure, which is great for um, our users that may not have operational experience. So the flexibility goes both ways. It exposes a very clean API for our users, which are our researchers, and also for the maintainers, which is our infrastructure team, so we can extend and customize the cluster as needed, because you never know when the experiment will lead us. Um, and so we're very excited to continue to invest in Kubernetes, and we're also super excited to see the new developments coming in 1.6 and also for the next year. So thank you.